Good morning. Would you stand with us? My name is Nick. My wife and I are visiting this weekend. We're so excited to be here. Let's join our voices together and worship God. Here we go. We're reaching out to welcome you, God. Yeah. To fill this place again with your song. Flood our thoughts with wonder and awe. Yes, Lord. And give us a greater glimpse of a never changing God. If you know it, sing with us. All we want. Because yeah. all we want and all we need is found.
go ahead and have a seat. Uh, as a church, we're going to spend some time talking about a book that God has given us to help us know him. And, uh, you know, we're in this series called All the Things. And so for you this morning, I thought I'd bring all the Bibles as well. You know, I've got lots of them up here this with me. But uh, today, I want to share a little bit more about what the actual purpose is of this book. But before I get to that, I want you to think about the most iconic love story that you can think of. And hopefully when I say that, maybe one of the love stories that comes to mind is the story of Romeo and Juliet. Right? It's such an iconic story. Now, if it's been a little while since you've been in high school English class or you know, dusted off your copy of Shakespeare's greatest works, let me just refresh your memory a little bit about this story. Romeo is from the Montague family, and Juliet, she's from the Capulet family. And of course, these two families have been warring for generations. But like any great forbidden love story, Romeo and Juliet meet, they fall passionately in love, and the rest of this play is all about them trying to be with each other. Now, if you think about this 16th century play written by William Shakespeare, and, and you think about it and you try to find out a little bit more about Italian history and culture, that's where they believe the play was set in Italy, and you want some information about what was going on in the world at that time, you'll probably get some clues from the play. Uh, there's an earthquake mentioned in the play, and there was an earthquake in Italy around the time the play was written. There actually were two historical families in Italy called the Montecchis and the Capalettis, and they're from Italy, and there was this history of them being at war with each other, feuding with each other, and so you'll get some clues about Italian culture and history from this play. But if I ask you to tell me all about Italy based on this one play, 
you'd tell me I was looking in the wrong place, and you'd be absolutely right about that. And yet some of us approach the Bible in the same way. We look at this as a historical text that maybe tells us the history of the Israelite people and their journey out of slavery in Egypt and through the wilderness. Some of us look at this like a history book that tells us the story of this man named Jesus that certainly seemed to have some sort of incredible impact in the first century. Some of us look at this like a history text. But others of us look at this like maybe a science book, and, and you hope to find lots of information about how the earth was created and the origins of the earth. Or, or maybe you look at it and you start to wonder things like, how did two animals or pairs of animals, two by two, come and enter into this giant ark? Like, did that really happen? Or was there really this flood that destroyed the whole earth? And we begin to look at this as maybe a science book. And while there is uh, some data that we can find in modern scientific phenomena that confirms some of the stories in this narrative, ultimately, the purpose of this book is not to serve as a history text or a science book. The purpose of this book from the Bible, from beginning to end, is a love story. The purpose of this book is to tell us the story of a God who loves us, who pursues his people even when they break his heart time and time again. It's the story of a God who pursues a people that disobey him in the garden. It's the story of a God who pursues the Israelite peace people even when they grumble and complain against him. The entire purpose of this book is to tell us how much God loves us and pursues us and wants to rescue us. And we can actually find the entire purpose of this book summed up in one verse that many of you know. It's John 3, 16. And it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. The purpose of this book that's made up of lots of little books written by many authors, is to point us to the God who loves us and rescues us through his son, Jesus. Now, one of my favorite children's Bibles is this uh, book. It's called the Jesus Storybook Bible. And one of the things I love about it is actually a tagline in the title. It says this. It says, every story whispers his name. And the thing I love about this Bible is that as it goes through the different narratives in Scripture, it points us to Jesus. It actually calls out the way the different stories in Scripture point us to Jesus. You know, it talks about how God sent a rainbow after the flood as a promise that he would never again destroy the earth. And, and then he promises us to make a way for our rescue through Jesus. He, in this book, in this children's Bible, we see the story of the Israelites who were rescued from slavery and captivity to the Egyptians, and then we learn that Jesus comes to ultimately free us from the captivity and slavery of sin. We read about a young boy named David who becomes a hero after defeating a giant, but ultimately he points to a greater hero who fights a greater battle against evil and death and ultimately wins. The purpose of this book is to tell us the story of a God who loves us and rescues us. Now, Romeo and Juliet is a tragic love story. It ends when Juliet, in an attempt to escape a marriage that her parents have arranged for her, uh, Juliet decides to fake her own death. And then when Romeo finds her, he is totally devastated and takes his own life. And then when Juliet wakes up, she sees what's happened. She's distraught. She takes her own life as well. And this iconic love story, it's just a play meant to entertain us. It ends in tragedy. Now, we have this book, this book that tells us of Jesus, and it would seem like it would end in tragedy. When Jesus goes to the cross, we might be tempted to think that that is the tragic ending, but we know that ultimately Jesus is victorious over sin and death. So the tragedy isn't the ending of this book. The tragedy would be if we were to just look at this like a historical text or, or a science book and miss the purpose that God had in giving it to us. 
the tragedy would be for us to cherry pick some verses from this book, different verses that might speak to us, but never read this whole thing in its entirety to see the story that God was trying to write to us. The tragedy would be to miss that grand narrative, this story that God loves us and pursues us and will stop at nothing for us. Now today, no matter where you are, whether you're new to faith or still exploring faith, or uh, maybe if you've been following Jesus for a while, if it's been some time since you've read through this entire book, maybe with that lens of what its purpose truly is, I want to invite you to take a step to do that. There's a couple really practical ways to do that. The first is if you're not a reader and maybe you just don't like reading, there's an app called Dwell. And in this app, scripture is read over you. You can even pick the accent that's used. They've got British accents and East African accents. And I'd encourage you, if you're not a reader, but maybe you have a long commute or, or you're exercising, you can have scripture read over you through this app. The other uh, option I want to share with you today is one that I use. I do enjoy reading. And uh, when I wake up in the mornings, uh, I spend some time in this, this one-year Bible. And uh, every day there's a reading from the Old Testament, uh, the New Testament from Psalms and Proverbs, and uh, I get to read through the Bible uh, from beginning to end. And God just reveals different things about his story when I read the entire narrative like that. And so for maybe for you it's the app, maybe for you it's jumping on Amazon right now and looking up a one-year Bible, but what is it that you can do to approach this book with the purpose that it was intended for, for us to see God's great love for us, his pursuit of us. If there is a God and he gives us a book to read so that we can find out more about who he is and the most important book we can ever read is this book right here, the Bible. Romans 15 says it this way. It says, everything written in the past was written to teach us the scriptures give us strength to go on. They encourage us and give us hope. This book, it teaches us who God is. It encourages us, but ultimately it points us to the hope that we can only find in Jesus. And so now we're going to continue to stand and sing together to Jesus, who is our living hope. So would you stand with me and let's continue to worship him. Great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not find. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine? So great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin. Hallelujah. Praise the one. 
in the morning that seal the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on us sing that again came the morning then came the morning that sealed the promise Your very body began to breathe Out of the silence The roaring light Jesus Declared the grave has no claim on me Jesus was His the that you are our living hope, that any other place we run to for hope would ultimately not satisfy us, but you, God, you are our hope. And so, God, we come to you hopeful and expectant for what you're going to show us and teach us today. Would you give us ears to hear you? Would you give us hearts that are receptive to whatever it is you want to say to us, whatever you want to do in us today? We love you, and we give you all of the glory. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So good to be with you this morning, Willow. Uh, before you take a seat, why don't you say hello to someone around you, and then you can grab your seat. right now and invite our guest host forward to collect our offering. Hey, if you're new here or you're a guest, please let the plate pass you by. This is just for those of us that call Willow South Lake our home. And while that's happening, I want to tell you about some really exciting news. Uh, Scott Woods, who's one of our pastors here, he and his wife Amanda just welcomed a new baby boy this past Monday. Yep. This is Ezekiel Rett. Woods, right? What a powerful name. And so uh, Zeke and his mom and dad are doing really well. Uh, Amanda tells me that he's a great eater and sleeper. What more could you want? I mean, that's perfect. And so uh, they're doing really well. And so when you see them over the coming weeks, please uh, congratulate them. But we're thrilled for their family. Now, you see Ezekiel, that little baby. Well, we have, obviously, we've got infants here and little kids. We've got junior hires and high schoolers. And if you are a parent of a high school student, we actually have a special meeting for you right after the service down front up here. And this is a chance for you to just hear about what's happening in our high school ministry and impact and just to hear about what you can look forward to in this coming year. So if you've got a high school student, join us right after the service down front. And uh, Ronnie Wood, our, our high school pastor, would love to tell you more about that. Now, earlier this month, we had a women's gathering, and the women of the church just loved it. And then we started to hear from the men in our church, like, when are we going to do something for the men? And so, men, we have not forgotten you. We've got a gathering coming up for you, a breakfast, on Saturday, March 14th. And uh, we hear that men like to eat, and apparently they cut their pancakes with an axe. So 
It's going to be a great time, uh, but you're going to hear some really challenging teaching. Uh, you're going to have time in community, and so hope you'll join us for that. You can find out more information at willowsouthlake.org slash men's gathering, but please, uh, men, we hope that you will, will take time out, put that on your calendars, and join us for that. Now, if you are married in this room, I would say to you that the most important relationship that you have outside of your relationship with God is your marriage. And we know if you've been married for some time that in order to have a great marriage, you have to work at it. And sometimes you just need to do things like tune things up a little bit. And next Saturday, we have this workshop coming up called Jesus in My Marriage. And the thing I love about this workshop is it's not just somebody talking to you and just telling you things. It's actually kind of a practical, hands-on workshop. So you'll hear from some different couples in our church here, and then they're going to give you some tools to work on things that you're actually uh, wrestling with currently in your marriage. And so if you're married, I want to encourage you, make this a priority. Uh, you do need to register you, so you can go to willowsouthlake.org slash marriage and register there. Now, one of the couples that's going to share at that marriage workshop is uh, Matt Wright, who's our acting executive pastor, and his wife, Krista. And today, our message actually is going to come from Matt Wright as well. Uh, we have been in this series called All the Things where we're looking at the Psalms that basically we experience the full range of human emotion. And so uh, today, Matt is going to dive into Psalm 42. So let's go ahead now and join in with Matt and our South Barrington congregation. I'm really excited for what I think God is going to be doing today in our time as we study his word. Eventually, we're going to get to Psalm 42, but we're going to start off in Mark chapter 4. So can we just dive in? You guys ready to go? Yeah. All right. So... So the disciples had just finished a very long day of ministry. Uh, Jesus had been teaching and doing miracles all around the Sea of Galilee for uh, several days in, the, in a row now. And is relatively earlier on in the ministry. So the disciples are still trying to figure Jesus out. Who is this guy? Uh, what, what, where is he going with all of this? Clearly there's something different about him. But they're exhausted. It's been a long couple of days after a long day in the heat with all these people right next to this water. We pick up our story in Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 35. This is what it says. That day, when evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go to the other side. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is, is a really big lake, uh, and, and it's big enough that the cities were kind of all around the shore of the lake. And so Jesus says, hey, let, let's go over here. I think we need to do ministry on the other side. And so they do it. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. Like right then and there, Jesus says, it's evening time. Let's go to the other side. So they get in the boat, and they start sailing. I have always figured that it was just them in the boat. But Mark is really careful to show us that there were others there too. There were also other boats with them. It's not Jesus and the disciples only. There are other boats. Now, time goes by. The disciples are rowing or sailing or whatever that looks like. And my picture of what that is is, is that the boat is kind of rocking back and forth. And it's warm. And the shadows are getting long. And maybe one of the disciples is singing a lullaby. And eventually Jesus drifts off to sleep. And maybe just, oh, how did, I, how did I go to sleep right here? But that's not exactly the picture that Mark paints for us. Mark says that Jesus went to find a cushion so that he can intentionally take a nap. And this really strikes me as funny because I picture the disciples ro rowing hard and they're doing ropes and whatever it is, all the stuff that you do when you're sailing. Like the disciples are working really, really hard and then they hear a rustling and they turn back and Jesus is digging between the cooler and the empty life jacket and pulls out a down pillow and just kind of curls up at the back of the boat because he's taking a nap. This is an intentional thing. Like disciples, could you guys keep all the sailing stuff down it's time for me to sleep, all right? I'm kind of a big deal, and I'm going to take a nap right now. So Jesus, he takes a nap. He goes to sleep. When a little bit of time later goes by, and the disciples off in the distance see a cloud start to come. And there's a little bit of a breeze. And the waves start to, to pick up just little by little. And eventually this builds and builds and builds until it gets pretty intense, and a storm has rolled in. Mark 4.37 says this, a furious squall came up. 
I find squall to be a funny word. Squall, it's not one that I use regularly in my language. It's what, when my kids are crying, I call it that they're squalling, right? Like, I, I don't talk about a squall. But this, this word for squall, the Greek word literally means an intense windstorm, like a gale force wind. That's what this word means. It's like a gale force wind. So something you should know about the area, the geography of this area. Like I said, the Sea of Galilee is a big lake, and it's surrounded by these mountains. And on the other side of the mountains is the Mediterranean Sea. So because of the elevation and just the way that everything is laid out, it's perfect for these intense windstorms to blow up over the mountains and all of a sudden just blow over the Sea of Galilee. These straight winds that would, that would blow with really a high level of intensity. They would be extreme. It was prone to those sudden extreme winds. And so what's normal for people who are on a boat, for people who are sailing, is that when the winds come, when the storm comes and the waves kick up, the idea is you want to keep the bow of the boat pointed into the waves. When you're in trouble, keep the bow of the boat pointed into the waves because the bow of the boat is what can break the waves. The bow breaks the waves and the waves go off to the either side and it keeps the water out of the boat. The risk, though, of the wind is that it's really tough. Because if you get the bow just a little bit off, the wind's going to push the boat sideways. And the next thing you know, the waves are coming against the side of the boat. And the water spills over the rails of the boat. And it builds. And there's more and more water. And there's risk of that boat tipping over. There's risk of that boat capsizing. And that's exactly where we find Jesus and the disciples. This furious gale, this windstorm blows in. And the waves are breaking over the side of the boat. The bow isn't pointed into the wind anymore. It's not pointed into the waves. So much so that it was nearly swamped. So much so that the thing was, was about to go down. Now, listen, I love the water. I love being on boats. I've, I've, I've spent plenty of time on the water, but I'm not really a sailor. So if you and I were out in the middle of Lake Michigan and a windstorm blows in and water's coming over the side of the boat, I hope you can swim well, because you're going to have to take the both of us. I mean, it's, it's not going to be good. I'm going to be panicked. It's going to be every man for himself. Grab the life jacket and make your way in for the shore, because I've got no experience doing this kind of thing. I don't have any experience sailing a boat in a windstorm, but the disciples are different. Don't forget that the disciples are lifetime generational fishermen. The disciples probably were on that boat before they knew how to walk. They grew up on the water. They learned to sail from their fathers who learned to sail from their fathers who learned to sail from their fathers. And they learned to sail on this lake. They know all about the weather patterns of this lake. They know all about what to do when the storm rolls in, what to do when the winds are really, really tough. They know all of the secrets. They are not inexperienced people like you or me. These are experts. And when the experts are panicking, it's intense. When the experts are worried, you better believe this is a serious storm. This is a serious issue. And don't forget, they're not alone. In my mind, I've always pictured that this is just Jesus and his disciples. Like, they're the only boat out on the water. Everybody else was smart enough to not be on the water right now. But remember, Mark told us that there were other boats with them. So there's a whole crowd, a whole community of boats that are out there. In other words, it's not just Jesus and the disciples who are at risk. It's every soul in every boat that is at risk. Every other boat has got waves coming in over the side. Every other boat there is taking on water. Every boat says we're about to capsize. It's real. It's bad. It's the whole community. Now, time out. Before we continue, I think there's an obvious parallel that we can make here. And, and the parallel is this. All of us, all of us face windstorms in our life. All of us have times in our life where we think everything is going okay, and all of a sudden, unexpectedly, gale force winds start to blow, and it makes our surrounding environment so volatile that we think we're going to start taking on water, and our lives are at risk of capsizing. All of us face times in life where, where the wind blows so hard, it feels like we can't hear ourselves think, and we're not making any progress. We all have those situations. 
I, I, I read that there are other boats there, and I think about uh, leadership and what it's like to lead other people. I know many of you lead businesses or lead organizations, and sometimes when you face that windstorm, you realize this crisis, it doesn't just affect me. It affects all of these people. Uh, maybe, maybe you guys missed the revenue target, and now someone's telling you that you're going to have to look at staff reductions. Or maybe you're the one who has to make the decision, are we going to do staff reductions or not? And look, these are people. You love these people. You don't make this decision lightly. This is, this is really, really hard. This is a crisis that doesn't just affect you. It affects everybody around you as well. And then on the backside of it, you've got to figure out, how do I do the same amount of work with less people? Because that's going to put a burden on everybody else. Maybe the storm for you is that, is that you got on the wrong side of the market. You put too many resources in the wrong place. You made too many wrong assumptions. And now every time you check the account, you get that sick feeling in your stomach. It takes your breath away because you know the implications. And you know it's not just going to affect you. It's going to affect everybody around you. You know the implications. Maybe the IPO failed. Maybe the VC firm is looking for some serious changes, and it's not just going to affect you. It's going to affect all the people that you love that are around you. We all face windstorms. Your windstorm could be at home, a child who's being bullied at school. You didn't expect this. You thought everything was going to be okay, and all of a sudden, it's not just affecting you. It's affecting your kids. Maybe, maybe your son, we found out that he's smoking weed again. And it feels like it's, it's causing your entire family to like take on water and you're against the ropes and you don't know what to do now because it's not just you. You bought the house. You signed the lease expecting that this was going to be the income and now something has changed and it's not just affecting you. It's affecting everybody around you. We all face storms. We all face the the, 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 the windstorms, the hurricanes, the tempests, we all face these things. But there's a few things that I've noticed about the storms. Sometimes, some storms come because we're fleeing from God. Sometimes we face storms because we're going in a direction contrary to the direction God wants us to go. In the Old Testament, there's the story of a prophet. And God so clearly says to him, I want you to serve over here. Go this way. I want you to do this. And the prophet doesn't want to do it. The prophet literally makes the decision to sail to the furthest point that's the opposite direction that he can think of. So he gets on a boat, starts sailing that way, and God allows him to sail into a massive storm. And the storm that he sails into is, is because he's fleeing from God. Because he's going in a life in a direction contrary to where God wants him to go. Sometimes the storms that we find in our life are because we're choosing to live a life contrary to God's direction. It could be that, that you realize that greed led to that business decision that is causing the storm that you're in right now. It could be that you realize that your arrogance led to this relationship with alcohol. And now it feels like you can't keep the bow pointed into the waves. And so all of a sudden, the water is coming in over the sides, and you feel like you might get capsized at any moment. Sometimes, sometimes the storms come because we're fleeing from God, but not always. Sometimes storms come because we're following God. Quick question. Not rhetorical. Really looking for a response. Who was it? that said to the disciples, let's sail on the other side? No, really. Who was it that said to the disciples, let's sail to the other side? Yeah. Don't forget, the disciples were following God. They took him at his word. Do you remember the way that the verse started off? It said, so right then and there, just as they were, they took him, they went to the other side in the boat. Do you think Jesus knew when he said, let's sail to the other side, that there was gonna be a storm? I think Jesus knew I don't think afterwards Jesus was like, my bad, I forgot to check the hourly forecast. Like, it said there was going to be sunny weather, but I don't know. It's just a, no, I believe that Jesus knew. 
Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen right when he told them to go. Here's the reality. The reality is that we should expect hard things when we take a step of faith to follow God. The reality is that we should expect resistance when we take a step of faith to follow God. Now, now I want to be careful to say, I'm not saying that every storm in your life is something that God has brought to you, that God has caused every storm in your life. What I'm saying is that God has allowed you to go into that storm because every storm has a purpose. He may not have caused that storm, but he allowed you to sail into that storm because he wants to do something in you. Every storm in your life has purpose. If the wind is in your face right now, if there's a part of your life where you feel like you're in the middle of a hurricane and you can't keep the bow in the waves anymore, you can't hear yourself think over the roaring wind, pay attention. Because God is doing something on purpose that he can only do in this situation. He may be redirecting you. He may be building you, but I can tell you right now, it is not accidental. Every storm has a purpose. God is doing something in you. So let's go back to our story in Mark chapter 4. Remember, for the disciples, this is not a figurative storm. This is a literal storm. To pick us back up, we're in Mark, a furious squall, an intense wind gale kind of a storm comes in, and it came up, and the waves broke over the side of the boat so that it was nearly swamped, and there's Jesus in the stern, in the back of the boat, sleeping on a cushion. You got to see that, like, this is really, really bad right now. Disciples and all the boats around them are about to go under. They're terrified. They're screaming at each other over the wind to try and get their attention. And then they see Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat. And this verse, this verse really, really gets me. Mark 4, 38. They finally get his attention. The disciples woke him up. And they said to Jesus, teacher. Don't you care if we all drown? Don't you care? And I just want the weight of that to hit. Jesus, don't you care? Feel the intensity in this, the terror, the crisis, and even the anger. Jesus, we're in this hurricane right now because we were obeying you. And you're saying that you knew about the storm before we sailed into it. Why would you have us sail into it? Because we're all about to die right now. And you're just wrapped up in your down comforter like the Queen of Sheba back here. And we're all just trying to stay alive. Like, wake up, grab a bucket and bail. Do something. Because if you don't, we're all going to die. And I'm beginning to think that maybe, Jesus, you don't care, teacher. Don't you care? Honestly, I've felt this before, and I doubt that I'm alone. Sometimes when we're in the middle of the own, our own windstorm, the windstorm of our life, it feels like God's asleep in the back of a boat. And we find ourselves wanting to say, Jesus, don't you care? Don't you care if I lose my job? Do you care if we lose the house? Do you care if I have to lay him off? Don't you care about my family if my family falls apart? Do you care about my kids, about my sister, about my mom, about my niece? Don't you care about my friends? Don't you care about what they're saying about me? Do you care? Jesus, are you just a teacher? Because I'm in the middle of the storm right now, and I don't think I need a teacher. I need something more than a teacher right now. I need a God who can actually help, who can actually, like, help bail the boat out. Uh, Don't you care? The core of this talk today is this. In life, we all have seasons of smooth water. And in life, we all have seasons of rough water. Every one of us experiences this. We all know it. We can expect it. If you're in a season right now of smooth water, that's great. And I think you can expect that in the future at some point, you're going to be in a season of rough rough water. It's just true. 
However, Christians often think that we have to pretend. Pretend that there's only smooth water, that there's never any rough water. Christians oftentimes wonder, is it okay for me to not be okay? Or do I just have to put on a face and say, God is good all the time, God is good, and pretend like on the inside, things aren't falling apart. We say God is good, and we try to put on a brave face so that our friends and our family, our loved ones, even God doesn't know what's really going on on the inside. That's what we hope, because on the inside, we're terrified. We think at any moment, I might drown, and I'm not even sure you care anymore. We're in a series right now called All the Things. The idea behind this series is that life is full of the full range of emotions. We all have joy and anger and excitement and fear. And yet our God is a God who can meet us in all the things. Even in all the storms, he's big enough to hear from you. Don't you care. He's big enough for that. So the disciples are there saying, we're going to die. And Jesus, I'm not even sure if you care. I don't know if you can hear me. I don't know if you're just a teacher or if you have the ability to do anything else. Don't you care? And then Jesus wakes up. And this is the part of the story that we all love. Look at the next verse. Jesus gets up. And he rebukes the wind and the waves. Rebuke is such an interesting word that he says to the wind, stop it. He rebukes the wind and the waves. He says to the waves, quiet, be still. And instantly the wind died down and it was completely calm. We all love this part of the story. I love this part of the story. The drama of it is unbelievable. When things were at their very worst, when it looked like at any moment the boat's going to tip over, and it's not just the disciples, but the whole community of boats that are out there, it's the worst possible instant. And Jesus stands up and says in a strong voice, quiet, be still. And we love that because sometimes that's what happens in the middle of the storm of our life. Sometimes Jesus stands up and he speaks and immediately things change. Sometimes he speaks and immediately you're healed. Immediately the loan comes through. Immediately the deal lands. Immediately the hire shows up. Immediately the project is completed. Immediately the relationship clicks. Sometimes he speaks and all is calm. And you know that there's something else coming here, right? Because he doesn't always do that. The truth is sometimes we call and call and call and call and he doesn't calm the waves. And so what do we do then? What are we supposed to do when he does not calm the waves? When we cry out and the wind still blows and we still wonder, do you care at all? We're gonna turn to Psalm 42 because I think Psalm 42 gives us a picture of what to do when he doesn't calm the wind. Psalm 42, verse 1 through 3 says this. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. I think that first verse is a verse that we have horribly misinterpreted for a long time. We've turned that verse into a really pretty nice Thomas Kincaid painting about a lovely deer in a lush forest drinking at a brook. We've turned it into a nice song as the deer pants for the water. Let me tell you the picture that's really being painted here. This psalm was written in the ancient Near East where drought and water scarcity is a real thing. This isn't a picture of a deer completely satisfied. This is a picture of a deer who is dying of thirst in the middle of extreme drought. This is a picture of a deer stumbling along, looking at every single corner they can find to say, like, I'm going to die if I don't drink right now. This is a picture of desperation. This is a picture of intensity. And the psalmist is saying in the same way that a dying deer in the middle of extreme drought is looking for water, that's what my soul feels like. My soul thirsts for you, God, the living God. 
not just a teacher. When can I go and meet with you, God? Because it seems like whenever I show up, it's not the right time and you're not there. My tears have been my food day and night while people say to me all day long, where is your God? The psalmist is saying, teacher, I'm in the middle of a drought. It feels like I haven't heard your voice in ages. Where are you? I can't find you. And all the storms, do you care? Can you hear me? I'm not okay right now. And will you show up when I'm not okay? And everybody around me is saying, where is your God? Everybody around me is saying, he's just a teacher. He really can't do anything in the middle of the storm. So you better get out and start swimming right now. They're saying, where is your God? And the psalmist is saying, are you there? Or are you just a teacher? He pours out his heart to God again and again, saying, please show up, please show up, please show up. And then it's interesting, in the middle of this storm, or in the middle of this psalm, rather, he shifts from talking to God to talking to himself. It's interesting, he does this self-talk thing. The next verse, this is what he says, why, my soul, are you so downcast? Downcast is interesting to me. The word downcast literally means sinking. (laughs) Why, my soul, are you sinking? The boat might might be sinking, but why do you feel like you're sinking? Why, my soul, are you sinking down low? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God, not just my teacher, but my Savior and my God, he is saying, look, when my soul feels like it's sinking like a boat, I am going to choose to remind myself in the identity of God. I'm going to remind myself of who he really is, that he's not just a teacher, but that he is God, my Savior. When I'm forgetting and I feel like I am sinking down, I'm going to remind myself of the promises of God, that I will yet praise him. I'm going to remind myself of the future. When it feels like I'm sinking, I'm going to remember that the boat may go down, but there is something bigger happening than this present crisis. What we learn from Psalm 42 is that when the miracle doesn't come, when he doesn't calm the wind and the waves, when the miracle doesn't come, the answer for us is to remember. When the miracle doesn't come, memory is the pathway to faith. Memory is the path to faith. Let me tell you what I mean. You and I are unbelievably forgetful creatures, aren't we? Especially when it comes to the things of God. I think you and I have spiritual amnesia that tends to come out more when it feels like the boat's about to sink. And we start saying, don't you care? Don't you care? And it it doesn't matter how many times in the past God has proven that he cares. When the boat's about to sink, we ask that question, don't you care? We forget that every storm has a purpose. He he may have just allowed us to to go into that storm, but he's doing something in us. We forget that, that there's a kind of faith that can only be developed in all the storms. And it can't be developed without intentional memory of who God is of what he has done, of what he promises for the future, and who he has said that we are. Let me put it this way. Your memory, your memory of yesterday will determine your steps today. What you remember about what God did in the past will determine how you act today. Memory is the path of faith. Your memory of what he did yesterday will determine your faith of today. And your memory of what God does today will determine your faith for tomorrow. Do you see this? Memory is the pathway of faith. Memory demands that we live our life differently. The world, in the middle of the storm, the world says to you, start swimming. But in the middle of the storm, God says to you, start remembering. Start remembering the battle is in the mind. The battle is in the mind. We have to remind ourselves of the truth, of the good that he's done, of the promises for the future, and we allow our steps to follow what he says. I have a friend um, that I was talking to a couple months ago, and uh, his, he's just got a lot of crisis in his life right now. 
And he was telling me about a new discipline that he was starting. He was telling me about all of the research that talked about these disciplines of gratitude. Have you heard of this before, the discipline of gratitude? There's a lot of research about this, that if you have a discipline of gratitude where, where you are intentional about naming things that you're grateful for, and the research says you don't have to say thank you to anybody in particular, you just say thank you to the air. But when you notice things that you're grateful for, it can completely change your life. And I just chuckled on the inside because I love it when science discovers things that God has been saying for thousands of years. <laughs> Here's the truth, guys. Memory is the path to faith. When we regularly have a discipline of remembering who God is, what he has already done, remembering the gratitude, the grateful things that we have in our life, when we remember his promises, when we remember who he says that we are, it builds our faith and it can direct our steps. Steps. Your memory of yesterday determines your faith today. Your memory of what happens today can determine your faith for tomorrow. Memory is the path of faith. So let me put it all together. Let's put it all together. All of us in our life will face the tempest. All of us in our life will face the furious squalls, the windstorms. And some of these storms come because we're fleeing God. Sometimes we face a storm because we're going in a direction opposite to where God wants us to go. Some storms come, though, because we're following God. And you ask, how do I know the difference if, it's, if I'm in a storm because I'm fleeing or because I'm following? You read his word. And if your life isn't aligning with how he wants you to live, it could be that you're fleeing from God. And you pray and you say, God, is this a storm that I need to, to change course? Or is this a storm where you say, press on? But some storms are fleeing. Some storms are because we're following. But the truth is, every storm that God allows us to go through has a purpose. Every storm has a purpose. The truth is that God is developing a faith in you that can only be formed in the crucible of wind and fear and waves. God is developing a faith in you in this present crucible that can mark you for the rest of your life. And he's not developing this in you because he doesn't care. He's actually developing it in you because he does because he does care. So if you're overwhelmed in the tempest right now, first invitation I want to give to you is to get honest with God about the rough waters. Instead of pretending that everything is okay, get honest. Ask him, is this storm I'm in because I'm fleeing from you or because I'm following you? And if he tells you that it's because you're fleeing from him, it's not too late to turn. It's not too late to say, I'm going to start sailing in your direction. I want my life to match up to the life that you want me to lead. It's not too late. And if the storm is because you're following God, I know it's hard, but I actually challenge you to praise God for it because he's developing a faith in you that can only be developed in this present crucible and throughout it all. Remember that, that your life and your soul is more than this situation right now. First, Get honest with God about the rough waters. And second, call out to God. Ask him for help. And if he shows up and he speaks and he calms the wind and the waves, praise God and remember it. Remember it. Allow the miracle of today to fuel your faith when you find the storm of tomorrow because it's going to come and your memory will determine your faith. So remember it. And if he doesn't bring the miracle, if he doesn't show up, remember. Remember the way that he's come through yesterday. Remember what he's done in the past. Psalm 42, 6 says, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you. When the miracle doesn't come, memory is the path to faith. So if you're here and you find yourself in a storm, you can look back on God's faithfulness and that can help you trust him for his future faithfulness. 
but we also have a prayer team here. And what I would say to you is that if you're in the storm, whether it's something you're fleeing from, if you're fleeing from God in it, or whether it's because you're following him and you find yourself in the storm, what I would say is don't go it alone. Uh, allow us to pray for you. We would love to do that. You don't even need to give us the details of what it is. You can just come forward and say, hey, I'm in a storm, and could you just pray for me? But I'd encourage you to not try to do it on your own. Get people around you. Our prayer team's here. Our pastor, our staff are, is here to pray with you, and we'd love to walk with you through whatever it is that you're facing. Would you stand with me as we close and pray? So God, Thank you for bringing us here this morning. And uh, there are people in this room that are facing storms right now. And God, I pray that you would whisper to our hearts, if it's because we are fleeing from you and uh, from what you want for us, God, would you, would you tell us that? And then would you give us the courage to move in a different direction? Would you give us the courage to make the choices, uh, to find the help that we need to go a different way? God, if we're here in a storm because we're, we're actually following you and uh, doing what we believe you're asking us to do, God, would you give us uh, courage and perseverance to continue? God, would you remind us of your faithfulness? Remind us that we can trust you, that uh, no matter what kind of storm that we find ourselves in, that you can work out a good purpose for us in the middle of that storm. In fact, uh, you can probably work out a purpose that you can't work out in any other time when we're in a storm. And so, God, uh, would you remind us that you are with us? Would you help us to sense your presence with us? And so, God, as we go out into our weeks ahead, uh, would you walk with us? Would you strengthen us? Would you whisper to us? Uh, we love you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have a student in high school, we'll have a high school parent meeting down here up front. Have a great week, everyone. Blessings.